was able to set us free and to bring us in the presence of the Father. Praise the Lord, saints, I, 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 I as we give thanks and I, praise I, I, unto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for his mercy, his loving care and kindness, see, and this, and this opportunity mean. that he has given us so that we can come in his presence tonight. I am thanking God for this wonderful privilege, and I pray that as we go into our lessons tonight, there are some things that we will all share with joy we will share that with joy because i want to let you know that i will not be with you on thursday night because i'm traveling so i will not be able to fulfill the, re the program on thursday but i will be with you through god's good grace on sunday and may god keep you within that period and time <clears throat> that uh, all will be well. Tonight I want to, you know, I'm hearing so many things about Christmas. And so many using their thoughts or their beliefs or however they carry Captain Donna good night. What I hear with good night. You know, and imposing things on others. And we, I want to take a little bit of the world's Theory and bring before you to help so that we can understand and even use the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he rightly said all things work together for good so this Christmas that so many of us when we became Christians we call it pagan and we call it all different manner of names we have become so righteous but yet still we giving out hampers Yet still, we having get together. All of this on Christmas time, don't do none of these things, I say. But if we are going to really be who God wants us to be and walk in the wisdom of the word of God, what we are going to do is to use this opportunity to sell the message of faith to bring others to a, a level of understanding, win souls unto the kingdom, sell Jesus Christ. We understand that it's a money maker. We understand that, that it's a man-made or whatever, but there are many man-made things that we use. The car you drive, the home you live in, all of these things, but yet still you, you honor these things. But this is an opportunity to remind the world of who didn't know that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. And we can do that as we are going to try to do tonight by going through the lineage of our Lord and Savior. Or the generations of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the manner in which he walked. So my cry to you and my request to you, keep your beliefs. Keep it in close quarters, but use the opportunity to declare Jesus Christ. Regardless whether he be a heathen, he be a Muslim, he be a whoever, they all celebrating Christmas. And let us use this opportunity to truly say how sweet the name of Jesus saw, and that is in a believer's ear. So as we go into our lessons tonight, let us take some time. You know, and get away from all of these things that you don't want to do and you don't feel you. Leave that alone. Don't do it. Don't be a part of it. But don't take part in activities that is pertaining to the season. Because you are saying, I don't believe in this, but yet still you are partaking in the activities of the season. Stop it. If you want to have a, a, a whatever, you can have it some other time. But don't use the period and time and then come to say, well, you know, I don't believe in Christmas. I don't believe in Easter. I do not. You know, listen to what I'm trying to say to you. Whether you believe in Easter or you don't. It's sharing with us. And it's reminding us that Jesus Christ, he walked the face of the earth. He paid the ultimate price. He was laid in a tomb. And he took his body up again, 
by his own power. So if this is telling you that Jesus is Lord and God of all, King of kings, Lord of our life and God of our salvation, we sing it, but yet still, you know, I don't think we understand. Let's use the opportunities that presents itself to us to glorify God in beauty and holiness. Let's stop pro pro projecting righteousness, you know, I'm, and, and I think that is not just right. That is not righteousness. That is religion. You, you, you know, you, you're religious. I, I don't care where you are. And as a matter of fact, who you are. The fact of the matter here is, if I'm going to use Easter to share with the world that Jesus was crucified, Je Jesus came and he walked the face of the earth. Jesus came and he died as a man. Jesus came and he was laid in a tomb. He was mummified like every other, just the normal way of the Jews. And he was laid in a tomb. And when they was looking for him, they couldn't find him, but they find a head wrap that he had on his head laid in one corner and their other clothes they laid in another corner. Something mysterious happened. And if I can use that opportunity to tell them that Jesus is no longer in the tomb, whether it be Easter or what, I'm going to share within that period of time. So I'm not coming there to tell you nothing about Easter is not is a pagan thing. Many pagan things were used to show forth the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we go into this lesson tonight, you are going to see some things here that you wouldn't believe. You're going to see some people here with some shady reputations. But these are the people that our Lord came through. These are the people that, that the Heavenly Father used to bring forth his son into this world to pay the price, the ultimate price, the price that the blood of blood and ashes of bulls could not suffice. He sent his son. His son came and died. And because of that, today we can say glory, hallelujah. So I ask God this evening, Heavenly Father, I called out to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm asking you to help us to understand and that we'll be able to walk according to your will, giving you the honor and the glory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, both now and forevermore. Amen. So when we look at this area here, it's going to be from the first chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. And you are going to notice that from the very first verse to the seventh to the sixteenth verse, there is a lot of hard names. And I do believe that so many areas here that we do not even get into. But I would like to walk with you tonight through these areas of scriptures. And I pray that you would help me as we go by keeping me in your prayer, because it's not as easy as it looks. So let us ask God again, we thank God for the guidance. Hear what it says here, and observe how Matthew began to put this together. Matthew opened his gospel with the genealogy, and this was to prove that Jesus is a descendant of both David and Abraham. Why? Because the promise that was made to David, that one will come and sit on his throne forever, now let us come, let us look again. It is from the lineage. Yet still, the son of David, Solomon, is dead and gone. But what was God was pointing through that promise to David is was pointing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you would observe here: David, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The reason for that is because of the promise that God made to Abraham. According to Genesis 12 and even from the very third verse. As you begin to see that, and as you begin to understand what that is really saying to you, you would be able to see why Matthew is giving us the genealogy, the manner in which he is doing it here. And also bringing forth some women into the picture, which normally in the Bible, you will not see this, or even in the genealogy of the Jews or any other nations, especially the Jews, you would not have seen women 
being played an important part in the lineage. It was always the men. And God had his reasons for that. So as we go into these areas here and we begin to look, I want you to see something here as we look at this. Now again, you will see in the first verse, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You will also notice that David came before Abraham. Was it really so? No, the last shall be first. And this is what is happening here. The promise was made to Abraham and it was also passed down to David. David who in the final end of things, who will now bring forth from his lineage, Jesus is going to come into the world. And this is why he is called the son of David. I want to remind you of the two blind men. When they heard what was going on, the tumult that was coming down the street, they didn't call out Jesus, just Jesus. They called out Jesus, thou son of David. And the question was asked, what will thou that I should do? And they said, give us our sight. And this is what we need today in order that we can truly see through the word of God what God is saying to us. This is a time that we need to really share great joys and understanding and belief. Observe in the second verse. And Abraham begot Isaac. Observe. So you see Abraham still started the second verse here. Even though in the first verse he came second in the sense of naming, being named, because to the end of it all, you know, even though Abraham is a forerunner, the, the lineage is, is, good, is gonna come from David, his lineage. And out of Judah, because of the promise that was made unto Judah, the scepter shall not depart from thee, from between thy feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh here meaning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are so many things for us to see in this lesson. Observe the lineage now from Abraham according to the promise according to Genesis 12. And sometimes we must go back and read these lessons. Welcome as Bishop Pompey. Sometimes we must go back and read these lessons. And Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Judas. Judas here is, is men, it mentioned Judas here in Greek. Uh, this is the, the Greek area or time or spelling of Judah. It's really Judah that is meant here and his brethren. And you can, uh, you can declare that because Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot Judas as written here and his brethren. You're talking about the 12 tribes. So when we look into all of this here, there is no question here. It's just the pronunciation and, and language. The Greek way of saying Judah. So we must be able to work with all of that and get God's understanding of it. And Judas begat Perez and Zara of Tama. I want to stick here a little bit. Because you see, we have become so prejudiced in our walk. But this is important here for us to see. It is showing us the manner in which Christ came into this world. There were some shady characters. There were some shady people. There were some, listen, prostitute, converted prostitute, being brought into the limelight of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's life. In other words, what this is sharing with us, it is showing us that Christ came for all people. Not just the Jews, but he came for all people and being a part of all nations. Let's look carefully here. And this is why we have to take the time to study. Welcome, Mother Selma. Thank you. You see, this is the time we have to look again and see what is happening. And Jacob begot Judas, and Judas begot his brethren, and Judas begot Perez and Zara of Tamar. Are we looking, you know, when we look at the, it's a hard name, but who is Tamar? And who is Judah? Let's think about that a little bit. Because Tamar was not of the Jewish nation. Tamar was a Canaanite. And beyond that, 
having two children for her father-in-law. Are you hearing me? But this is how God organized it. This is how God set it in place. There is a reason why we can go back and, and re find out the reason why and how Tamar ended up in this situation with her father-in-law. Because he made a promise and never upheld his promise. But you see, she recognized that there is a blessing in this family. And I need to be a part of that blessing. So if you wouldn't give me your son now, who is able, who you promise unto me, sure by name, now that he is grown and you wouldn't give him unto me, okay, I'll show you that I have wisdom and I am able to understand and that I am going to be able to be a part of this family with or without your consent, but yet still it's going to be according to your consent. So what she realized is that he was going to share the sheep and she dressed as a harlot. She was obedient to you. She maintained her mournful status, wearing the clothes that would prove that she is in mourning. But for that time, she took it off because she, she recognized what was happening. I'm being played and I'm tired of being played. Now that I know that he has grown and I'm being played by you, Judah, I'm going to let you know who I am. And this is why I say sometimes our women, if we are wise and learn to walk and remain in the office and the understanding and the, the, the position which God has placed us, we would be able to, you know, somebody said, women rule the world. If only we understand the power that we have and stop trying to be men. This is a serious way. But she, I mean, this is a scripture that is being brought forth. This is not what Bishop Xavier feels to say. This is what the scripture is saying here. When she recognized what was going on, she took off the mournful garment and she dressed as a harlot and went on the side of the street and Judah, whose wife died, now going to share the sheep, to cut it short, went in onto her. And as I always say, it wasn't for a good time. This woman had a determination. I'm going to get, I'm going to be a part of this family. I'm going to bring forth children for this family. I'm going to do something. So that moment, or that momentary time that he spent with her, you know the story and all the things that she took from him, his bracelets, his staff, and all the rest of it. When he recognized that she was pregnant, or the message came, he sent his elders to bring her in so that she can be burnt. But in wisdom, she said, to whom these belong, he is the father of my child. And everything came back to him. But let us move on here. So you see here, this Canaanite woman began now to play an important part. And the twins that she brought forth with for Judah, Perez and Zara, of Tamar, according to the third chapter, third verse. And Perez begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aaron. Now look at, what is, look at what is happening here, church. Let us open our eyes for a minute. Let us come off all of these things. You know, we love to stand up and, and point fingers and condemn and say all manner of things and not understanding what God is doing. Sometimes it might be in your own home. But God, God, listen, we don't have no purpose, you know. It's God's purpose that we are being full, that we are fulfilling him. It's not our purpose. Every single thing, according to the fourth chapter of, of Daniel, we love to quote Daniel, the fourth chapter of Daniel, the thing is the 19th verse, where Nebuchadnezzar himself stood up and he said, he said, God is in control of the affairs of men. So when we stand beside and we begin to point that finger, we failing to acknowledge that God is in control of the affairs of men. Just as you reach to the point where you came to a certain knowledge and acknowledge certain things in your life and maybe change. You might be doing certain things differently, but I'm questioning your heart. Your heart. 
And you might see the, 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 the rum drinker. Or you might see, you know, I've traveled yesterday with a guy, a Rasta man, and he had all this thing on him. And in his car, he have Haile Selassie. He passed a guy with, who was normal. And for some reason, it seemed as though he had a stroke. He passed him a bit. He said, man, I can't pass this guy. And he backed up. And he opened the car and let the young man, it's a young man, but he's crippled and his movements are limited. He backed up and took him up and dropped him where he needed to go. Some of us, you know, you would sit among your own brethren and they will fail to entertain the ministers of God. You know, and you're going to ask me all manner of questions. You're going to speak in all manner of things, love you one another and all of this kind of thing. But I watched that man. He reversed his car. And it's not a taxi, you know, he was running PH. He back up and took up that man. He said, I want to at least do one good thing every day. And sometimes I question my own people, how deceptive and how deceitful we can be. And we saw that in Judah's life. We saw the inconsistency in the life of Judah. Just as we love to stand and and condemn certain things from the pulpit and we know that everybody else is wrong and we are right. Search yourself. But see how God is working. God is using a little of everything to bring forth this special child. Look at this. The fourth verse. So you see here Ezra and Perez. Perez begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nathan, and Nathan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, off of Rahab, off of Rahab. We're talking about people with questionable lifestyles. Rahab the harlot, who saved the spies. And because of her heart and, you know, she didn't just seek to save herself. But she said, listen, if you have found favor in me, then I want you to know you've got to save me and my household. And Joshua was so wise. He said, listen, the only people that will be saved is the people that is in your house when we return. So there are times when we have to make certain decisions and stand by them. So if any of her family was on the outside, it's no longer my boat, my my bad. And you know, I'm I'm not going to be held guilty of this. So all that you want to save Rahab, bring them inside here. I'm no longer looking at your prostituting life. I'm looking at what you have done for the God of Israel. Because we are a people with no land. We are a people being delivered from Egypt. And we are a people going in search of a land, the land that was promised unto our father Abraham. But yet still, something is happening here that is beyond you and me. So Rahab, listen, I want you to see this. And Salmon begot Boaz off of Rahab. These are names that I wish you would go back because, you know, you don't hear ministers preaching on these lessons. This is too much of a hard name, and this is, you know, and I, I'm glad if someone come and take it up and make it a little more simple than I can, because I don't know everything, you see. And Boaz begot Obed of, of Ruth, and say, sharing with you these things, because it is important. Who was Ruth? Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth, they used to, to sacrifice children unto Molich. They will take live children and and throw them into the fire and rejoice. Give glory to this this God that they are serving. They would rejoice. You know, the time has come for us to open our eyes and and really understand. And I don't care who you are. When you're standing, all you're standing to tell me about Christmas is a pagan thing. Use the opportunity of Christmas to tell the world how sweet the name of Jesus is. Keep your beliefs to yourself. 
Don't go out to no Christmas party. Don't, don't give no thing. You're running all around and you're begging for this and that to give little children gifts. Well, then you are encouraging them to, 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 to celebrate Christmas because every year they're going to be looking for the gifts. Brethren, I know it's sometimes it's hard, but we have to do it. I have to do what I have to do. You see, and Salmat begot Boaz of a Rahab, this converted harlot who is going to become the great, great grandmother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you know that? These are the things that we have to open our minds to and preach righteousness and those who are on the outside of the paling those who may be belonging to different organizations or religion we have to share that light we have to share that love and that fellowship one with the other and look at what is going to go on here and boaz begat obed of root and obed begat jesse and Jesse begat David the king. So you would realize, you would recognize here how important it is. So you're seeing what is happening. And David the king begat Solomon. Of observe, church, I want you to see this thing because you know we would stop preaching certain negativity. You know, you stand from the pulpit and all every Sunday for Sunday upon Sunday, all you could preach is adultery. Fornication. And the, I mean, fornication is the greatest sin. But this is all you can preach. Preach around that to get people to be able to acknowledge I have fallen short and I need to walk in a certain way. Help them to get there rather than pointing out their faults the way in which some of us do. You're even preaching to other ministers, but what are you going to do? You know, some of them, they they believe they're preaching the right word, but they are wrong. Come on. Let us, let your light shine by bringing the message so that we can see here. This is a something that you don't hear people talking about because this is one of yeah, these hard names. I can't deal with that. And some, some of them I myself cannot even pronounce rightly. But observe what is taking place here, church. And David... The king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. We understand what David did. Stand up on his house top, looking over, looking down on Uriah's wife, bathing in her bathroom, and sent and called her when he recognized that she was pregnant. What he did, he sent Uriah to the battlefront to be what? Killed. Church, as we begin to see all of these things, this is a lineage that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came through. In his blood, he knew all of this because he is Lord. He understood all of this. He felt the pains of all of this. Do you think Jesus was happy to see Uriah going to the battlefront and be killed and David taking his wife? You know, David paid a price for that. A great price. So we have to look here. And Solomon begot Rabon. And Rabon begot Abia. And Abia begot Asa. And Asa begot Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And now, and among these names here, there were good people. There were common people. And there were people of shady, shady, shady reputations. And most of all, very, very evil. Manasseh begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Hosea. And when we think about Hosea, when we mention Hosea here, it's something that we need to be, be able to really look at and think. Who was Hosea? When you go back to, I think it's 2 Kings 13, or either 1 Kings or 2 Kings 13, when the man of God came within the temple when this king came to incense the, the, listen he came to burn incense onto the altar of God and the man of God ran listen and crying out oh altar oh altar 
And you know, when he stretches hands, listen, the king stretches hands because he was angry because of the cry of the man of God. When he stretches hands, his hands remain just as he stretched it out. And what happened? The prophecy came forth. One shall come by the name of Hosea. He was not yet in his mother's womb. And he shall burn all the bones upon this altar and it will be cast out. When he realized that he couldn't pull his hands back in, he cried out to the man of God and he said, Oh man of God, pray for me that my hand be restored. The man of God did such a thing. And his hands was restored. And to the end of it, he is now inviting the man of God to come in his home and eat. He said, I will not eat bread with you. You know, there are times I will separate myself. And there are times you have to separate yourself. There are times you have to stand alone. Paul tell us that. If you're not happy with certain things, you know, if you're going to stretch your hand, I want to say something to you. Today you see a big sign with a hand and a heart. You must understand what that means. If your heart cannot go with your hand, don't stretch it out. And don't be too hurried to, to go out there and greet. But you have to know what you are doing. Let your greeting be according to the will of the Father. So there are so much things here that I want to share with you tonight. Look at what is happening, church. I want to see this here. In the name of Jesus. And Manasseh, begot, I'm, I'm in the ninth verse. And Hosea begot Jotan, and Jotan begot Akaz, and Akaz begot Ezekiah. And we know who Ezekiah was. You know, just before going into Babylon, you know, he showed off all the good things of the house of God. You know, he disrespected the house of God. And we are doing that today, you know. You, you, you have all these cameras within the inner court, and it's no longer a holy place anymore. You have all of these things, and you, you know, come on, people making video in the inner court, the secret chamber, where God said, could any good thing come out of Jerusalem? Even Moses standing on the mount, that part of the ground that was considered, God said, listen, take your shoes off your feet because this is holy ground. The place that you had set aside within the house or the temple of God to be holy ground, you're not walking in there with shoes. You're not walking in there anyhow. And you're saying, that's all right. I'm speaking against it. I'm speaking against it. The 11th verse. And Hosea begat Jehoachim, and his brethren, and about that time, they were carried away to Babylon. Now you are going to see some things here that is so important for us to really observe and absorb. And after they were brought to Babylon, Johannias begat Shealtel, and Shealtel begat Zerubbabel. So I'm saying to you here now, Zerubbabel was born in, in, in Babylon. You know, these are the people that you're going to see here that God at one point in time was calling and called upon when they go back to Jerusalem to build the temple because Ezra, who again was another one prophesied to bring forth such a message again to tell the world. This is all of this. You know, sometimes we stand up and we, we condemn Old Testament. And why are you going into the, Well, all of this here is Old Testament messages being brought forth by Matthew to help us to understand. And without that foundation, we cannot build. So we need to study to bring ourselves to this point. So again, when we look here, church, after they were carried away in Babylon, you see some of the Jews, we call them now Babylonian Jews because they were born in, in Babylon. You know, even as Moses was born, in Egypt, he was an Egyptian Jew, but again, he, he loved the Lord. There were other areas, we cannot go there now. But let us look at this. And Zerubbabel got Abijah, and Abiyu got Elkam, El 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 and Elkam got Azor, 
And Azor begat Zodok. And this is the reason why we run away from this area of scripture. And Zodok begat Achin, and Achin begat Eliud. And Eliud begat Elizar, and Elizar begat Martin, and Martin begat jo Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share something with you here. There is a reason why Matthew is giving us this, this 16th verse. And Jacob begat Joseph and the husband of Mary. He didn't say the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is called the Christ, the anointed one. Messiah also means anointed. So the generations, this is, this is the kicker here. I'm going to share, you, share with you something. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. Check with me. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So what we are looking at here is 42 generations. How long do we consider a generation? 70 years? So 42 by 70. And you would see what is happening here. The period and time. Church, I'm asking you to understand what God is saying and why he is saying what he is saying. So as we, we realize that it's 42 generations before our Lord and Savior came into this world. Or it took to preserve a body, I like to put it this way, 42 generations it took to preserve a womb that our Lord and Savior could have come through. To enter into this atmosphere, and you know sometimes we say it's a good thing to be on this side of the planet because we do not understand what is on the other side of this planet, which is the spiritual side, or the side that we cannot see unless God open our eyes. And this is what is happening here. So again, when you read that 16th verse, you know, even though some say, if, if God had to have a son, he had to have a wife, I want to tell you something, something we need to know who God is, and we need to give God the honor and the glory because of his authority. Which man, he not even... I mean, not even Moses could stand up and call, let there be, and there was no. Moses was instructed, what you have in your hand, a rod, well then use it. That's the limitation of man. If we would walk under instruction, we'd be able to perform miracles. But the mystery belongs to God. All we are doing is fulfilling, it's God who performing all of these things. So we have to see this and understand this. And this is what is happening here. The preparation to bring forth this man child into the world. It took 42 generations. I want to take you back to the book of Isaiah, the 11th chapter. And I want you to see something. From that period and time, what was happening there is that it took, it's over 400 years let me get that book. It's over 400 years. These prophets were prophesying and telling the Jewish people, this is why, this is why, you see, Matthew went to the extent to share to the Jewish people and to bring them to that understanding that the Messiah that was promised to Abraham and to David is coming from their own lineage. Even Moses made it clear unto them, according to, I think it's Deuteronomy 15, he said, God is going to raise up one just like me, but from among you. And this is why it was prophesied 
that are to Abraham according to thy seed, not thy seeds, plural, no, but according to thy seed, the Messiah will come. And when he come again, 400 years during the period of time that Isaiah was prophesying, and hear his prophecy according, you can also go to the fourth chapter of of Isaiah, and you would see there where he is called the branch. So you see that must, uh, I, Isaiah been prophesying pertaining to the coming of our Lord even before we reach here. Here, this area here is a bit of a fulfillment, sharing with us who he is and what he is and how he will be. So when we stand up sometimes and we say, well, you know, I'm going to say it like it is. I don't care how you feel. We have to consider how people feel. You have to know when you are hurting others. You have to know how to bring over. The truth must be told. Please understand this. The truth must be told, but there's a way to do things. And when we do it according to the way that God has for us, we will really receive what he has in store for us. Hear what Isaiah is saying here. The righteous reign of the branch of Jesse. This is just the headline in my book. The righteous reign of the branch of Jesse. And when you go back to the fourth chapter, you will see him speaking of the branch. The branch here meaning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we go back again, the branch, the, from that olive tree, the natural olive, a branch was broken off. But again, all of that is, and that branch is the Gentiles. So we have to see all of this and understand this. And I'm reading from the very first verse. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And Jesse begat David, didn't he? And a branch shall grow out of his root. As we go back to the 53rd chapter of this very book of Isaiah, we would see and know how he grew. You know, he wasn't even pleasant to look upon. You, you know, all of these things, the word is saying to us if we would receive it. But we are being told they were looking for a king to come riding on six black horses, but this is not how we came. He came as a dying savior, and they could not acknowledge this. If you are the Messiah, if you are the God in human form, how is it this going to happen to you? We cannot receive that. So we cannot accept you. They are still looking for a Messiah. But the Messiah came and he paid his price. And this is what we were told. He was already here. He paid his price. Hear what the second verse says. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I love this. Because when John came preaching and ministering, John made it clear that I am not the Messiah. I am only the messenger. But he that cometh after me, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to loose, is greater than I am. And he shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So definitely, this is another area that we can go into. As we look carefully into all these areas here, it is really sending us somewhere. So we don't want to deviate. I want to get you who the Messiah really is. And the third verse, and shall make him quick. This is what God is going to do. There was no other good enough. To carry this anointing. There was no other good enough. That the, the, the outpouring of the spirit of God. Was able to rest upon. And he was able to carry that burden. Even as Moses was carrying a certain anointing. For all these years. Until, hello, until one night he laid his hands. When Joshua felt a bit jealous. And said how come. He laid his hands one night. Upon 70 of the elders. And they prophesied all night with just an unction of the spirit that was upon Moses or the anointing that was upon Moses. 
And when Joshua recognized that they were prophesying all night, he came to Moses because he felt a jealousy. But Moses said, it's not mine, but it's the Lord. Why feel jealous? Give God the thanks. And today when we're looking carefully, in and among us, when we see others maybe moving different to us, we begin to judge them. We begin to say all manner of things. But God moves in a mysterious way and his wonders to perform. As I heard a minister say today, we have to be very careful. He said, I don't have education. He said, but I have insights. He said, God speaks to me. And this is important. He said, I don't, his elder said, I don't have education because he couldn't read. He said, but I have inspiration because God inspires me. There are those of us, I want to say something to you today. The greatest enemy in the church today is education and money. This is the greatest enemy of the church or of the world. When we look around and we see what is happening, education and money is the two greatest sins of the world. And I want you to think about it. Don't judge me by what I say. I want you to think about it. And this is what is happening. Education and money. You know what I speak about Nebuchadnezzar or Nicodemus as a matter of fact. When he came to Jesus, Jesus said, how come you are ruler of the Jews? Cannot understand spiritual things or the things that I speak unto you. But yet still he was an educated man. He was a talented man who listened to create the hanging gardens and put it into place, engineering, that it's not falling, it's just there, the hanging. And you understand what is happening. When we begin to see these things and we begin to place ourselves in the presence of God and scripture, listen, understand what is happening here today. But here God has something for you, whether you could read or write or not. Let no one stand. And, and when you stand there and you're hearing from the, word, from the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and these carnal minded, just remember what I'm about to say according to the psalmist, you cannot go to heaven with a carnal mind. And this is what we're doing. You're speaking, but no Holy Ghost is even revealing or, or making you know, well, this is right, or taking you off of it and placing you where you need to be. But you have a book in front of you and all you know is what the book says. Where are your spirit of intelligence? Look at what God is saying here. And this is what Jesus has promised unto us. He said, and shall make him, again for those who are following, it's from the 11th chapter of Isaiah, the third verse. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now think about this. Mark these scriptures. Follow them up and see what it's saying. And he shall, and this is what is happening. You know, I heard a message this morning where the John said, is given a, a, a sermon on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the spirit that is going to come, the Holy Ghost, to make known unto us and to remind us and to bring us to that point whereby we should understand what God is doing. We are still not listening to that spirit. We are still walking again according to our own ways. And the time has come for us to hear. Remember what Jesus said, he that had an ear to hear, let him hear. When you are standing there bringing a message, are you hearing from God? Or is it that you are just speaking of according to your intelligence? You must be able to hear from God. And if you are not hearing from God, you are empty. So it's not just how intelligent I am. It's not how good, I'm such a good orator. But think about what the word is saying. When you are speaking, are you feeling anything? 
He said, when you open your mouth, I will fill it with good things. The witness here is the Holy Spirit. You need to know when you are, you are speaking something and the, the Holy Spirit needs to, to comfort you in that area. And if you are not feeling anything, you are just a sounding brass. You could talk. You could bring a good message. I have no problem with that. But again, it must be a spiritual message. And this is how important this is. This is what God is saying here. He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his ears, neither reprove after the hearing. He shall not judge according to the sight of his eyes, neither reprove according to the hearing of his ears. You don't like somebody and you will not, you know, some, some of us, I don't want to, to put you to say anything because you might say something that I will have to come and correct after. Who are you? You are God. Why don't you listen to what is being said? And maybe if you listen to what is being said, it will take you to another level of understanding. So we have to know where we are. We have to know. And when you see, when you begin to put yourself on this pedestal above everyone else, and you alone is right, and everybody else is wrong, I want you to think again. Take a second look at yourself. Take a second look. Remember what this word is saying. He shall not judge after the sight of his ears his eyes neither reprove by the hearing of his ears when you you hear something and because you hear that you know you begin to treat that person with scant courtesy and this time that person is laughing at you, you know because they are seeing you they could see you as big you know our elders at one time as as the minister said this morning he said my my elder couldn't read and write but he had inspiration and you could read and write with no inspiration. You are not doing anything. The time has come for us to lift ourselves. He said, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor? Are you questioning what is happening? So church, as we look carefully into these lessons, and we are looking at our Messiah, these are the messages that I pray we would carry rather than I don't keep Christmas. I don't celebrate Christmas. I don't want to know that that's your business. But I'm going to tell you what Christmas really represents. What we share at Christmas. And what the Bible permits me to share. That Jesus was born. And I'm not here to tell you he was born on the 25th of December. I'm not here to tell you that. No. I'm not here to tell you that. There is a sacred calendar and there is a, another calendar. And we have to know where we are. And we have to walk accordingly. But again, which righteousness shall he judge? So now we are going to see here what is happening. And let us go back to the book of, of Matthew, the first chapter, and the 18th verse. And it begins to speak in a very positive way. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Think about it. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, before they came together. Church, church, church. Is this mysterious here? Well, even the very Quran said, the birth of Christ was a mysterious one. The birth of Christ was not just. Mm -mm. The birth of Christ was a mysterious one. And we have to understand that. Now I want to share something with you here if I can find it very quickly. Where Mary and the angel begin to communicate. And when that happened, yes, I'm going to read from the 29th verse 
of the first chapter of Luke because we're dealing with the generation and the birth of Jesus. And when she saw him, this is the angel. You know, we've heard angel. We don't talk about angels. When you talk about angels, you're out of context. And when she saw him, she was troubled. So far different to Zacharias. When Zacharias saw the angel, the very angel, he, he was fearful. But Mary was troubled. What is this? Why are you here? And casting her mind, what manner of salutation is this? Because the angel had saluted her. Listen, and the angel, the 28th verse, and the angel said, angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And Mary was troubled. So she wondering, well, why? This manner of salutation is being given to me. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So we come right back here to see the lineage of David and also Mary being of the lineage of David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, the house of Israel forever. And his kingdom there sh and, to and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now this is why I always say to you, ask questions because the very scripture points us to this. And sometimes we don't take that time to ask these questions. Hear what it says. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Observe, Mary was pure from anything of the world. And she said, I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I want you to listen to this carefully. Because as Christians sometimes, you know, when we are asked questions and we stand up fumbling sometimes because we are not able to truly bring forth the word of God. Because we are not taking the time to read. And, you know, as the minister said this morning, you don't have to, to sit down and read for two days, you know. You could go to work, you read a verse of scripture, you're traveling on the bus, come off the phone, stop sending this text and that text, and just meditate upon the verse of scripture that you read this morning. Focus and ask God to reveal it. And if you're not be careful, you're going to end up shouting in the magazine or wherever you are because your meditation is on the testimonies of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is how important it is. And, the, and I mean, think about this. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, purification, preparation. This is what the Holy Ghost is doing. Even though she was free from all sensuality, the Holy Ghost is now going to come upon her and remove every form of sensuality if it's just for that moment. And the power of the highest, the power of the highest, not just the Holy Ghost. Observe what we are reading here. The power of the highest God himself shall overshadow thee. Therefore that holy thing God placed a part of himself into the womb of Mary to be nurtured, to grow, and to become, to come forth into this world as the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. And that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Church, as we begin to think about these things and understand why the message came the manner in which it came is to help us to understand 
and to really show forth the glory of God and to really bring forth. So when we stand here, again, I close with this. Use this opportunity to tell the world that Jesus came forth into this world to win us unto salvation. Use this moment to share with the world that Jesus is the only source of our salvation. Use this moment, this Christmas moment that you, you're running around bowling is pagan this and pagan that. You don't have to exercise in it, but all you're exercising is just what the words say. So we are asking God to revive the work, O oh Lord. Let thy mighty hand make there. Speak with the word, the voice that raised the dead and make thy people hear. This is what we need now. More than all of this senseless things that we are preaching, this pig on this and this pig on that and this pig on. Use that, use that to win souls for Christ. Use that as Paul did. He said, with all that I see you doing, you still have a sign mark here, the unknown God. We know what we worship, but you don't know. So that sign you have there, the unknown God, is the same God that we are speaking of, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God, the power of the highest, that placed his son into the womb of Mary, and she brought forth his son. So I'm saying to you, is a spirit that went in there, you know, is a spirit that God, a spirit, a, a part of himself that he placed in a womb in her to bring forth his son. The only sacrifice that he would accept on our behalf because of salvation was his son. The book of Hebrews 6, 7, 8, and 9 tell you nothing Nothing, the blood of goats, the blood of, and the ashes of heifers could not suffice, but it's only the blood of Jesus. And when you go back to the fifth chapter of Revelation, from about the fifth verse, when the 24 and el 20 and four elders stood before the throne, and the lamb appeared, and they cried out, you have delivered us by your blood by his blood i want to read that for you you know sometimes again you know i always like to share with you what i'm saying so that you would have a better idea you know you wouldn't just walk away because sometimes what i notice is some of us we preaching what we hear you know we're not preaching what we know and we need to preach what we know otherwise we are not doing god's will hear what it says I'm reading from the fifth chapter of Revelation. I'm going into the book of Revelation. I was about to read to you from the book of John, thinking that I'm in Revelation. But excuse me, let me get that for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And hear what it says. I'm here now. From the fifth verse, I'll read. And one of the elders, the fifth chapter of Revelation, I'm, and I'm reading from the fifth, the fifth verse. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb, and it, as it had been slain, having seven heads and seven eyes, seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into the world to search the world. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one their harp and gold and vial full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals, therefore, thereof, for thou was slain 
and has redeemed us to God. And I want you to hear this. And has redeemed us to God by thy blood. By thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And what I shared with you is the 42 generations that Jesus had to go through and to acknowledge and realize that he is the God of all people, not just the God of the Jews, but the God of all people. And he came dying and he went through all of this in order to bring us to that point that we can give God praise today. Again, I thank you all. Again, you know, sometimes this, we, we are not as clear as we would like to be, but we give God the praise that I can still bring to you the message. I am acknowledging, yes, it's not as clear as it, it's normally be, but again, we thank God for the opportunity that we can still share in this. So use this Christmas to tell the world how sweet the name of Jesus is. And don't be afraid to tell them, it's not the 25th of, of, of December that he was born. But we must be able, we are acknowledging his birth. He came into the world. And hadn't he came, he would not have been able to pay the price that he paid. He would not have been able to be crucified on a cross. He would not have been able to be given gall and vinegar to drink. And to cry out, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. So Christmas that as we call it the or the birth of christ plays an important part in our salvation and this is what we have to give god thanks for so get out from this all of these things that we are we are pushing forward song bites we don't need those song bites we need jesus so may god bless you all may god make his face to shine upon you all, and may he give you peace good night one and all I thank God for this opportunity, for this privilege to share with you the generation and the preparation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I love it. The birth and preparation of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the only one who could have paid that price. May God bless us all and keep us. May he make his face to shine upon us. And I want to remind you on Thursday, I will not be with you, but I will be with you on Sunday. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ. Our Bible study continues on Tuesday. That has nothing to do with Thursday night lesson. Our Bible continue, lesson study continue on Tuesday. So may God bless you all. And may God make his face to shine upon you. And may he give you peace. Thank you one and all. Much grace in Jesus name.